afternoon and welcome to Hudson. Uh, founded in 1961 uh, by strategist Herman Kahn, Hudson Institute challenges conventional thinking and helps manage strategic transitions to the future. On behalf of Hudson's South and Central Asia program, I welcome you to today's talk on India and China after the Doklam standoff. This summer, um, the two countries were involved in an almost eight week long standoff over their uh, 2,000 miles long border. The crisis erupted when India opposed China's attempts to extend a border road through the Doklam Plateau. The standoff ended in a, end August 20, 2017. China is one of India's top trading partners with almost 70 billion in bilateral trade, yet the two countries view each other as adversaries and incursions and military standoffs repeatedly happen in the last few years. We are privileged that to discuss this, we have with us today Dr. Manoj Joshi, Distinguished Fellow, Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. Most of you know Dr. Joshi and you have his bio in front of you. So I will only say that he has spent three decades as a journalist. He was most recently a member of the Task Force on National Security. Um, he has also written two books on Kashmir. Personally, um, I'm thrilled that Dr. Joshi and I actually share not only the part of the country we come from in India, but uh, that his two alma mater, St. Stephen's College and Jawala University, are mine as well. Um, what I was hoping to do was to ask Dr. Joshi to speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then I would use my privilege to ask him a few questions before I open up uh, the floor to the audience. Dr. Joshi. Thank you, Aparna, and uh, great pleasure to be here at Hudson, especially when uh, my fellow countrywoman uh, is introducing me. We come from a very small neck of woods back in uh, India. And so I feel especially proud that the Aparna is uh, introducing me. Uh, you know, I'm going to put up two maps and later on uh, just to explain. So when I start speaking, don't get, I, I think it, 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 it get, get a bit bewildering when I give certain details. So. The, this, this Doklam standoff uh, that began uh, in June 16th was when China tried to build a road in the Doklam area. I think if we can have the second one first, it would be a great idea. Because the second one, this is the Doklam uh, area. Uh, yeah, this, no, the, the other one. Yeah. So in, in this area, the, this, this, this part of it is China. This is India, and this is Bhutan, but China contests this. China says that it belongs to it. They have, in any case, built a road here in 2005. This is a New York Times map. So they had, they had built a road here in 2005, and then they would patrol to this area on foot. This is just about two or three kilometers. The crucial thing is this area. This is a ridge which overlooks a very sensitive parts of in, uh, sensitive part of India. So this is called the Doklam uh, Plateau. Uh, India has strong positions here. So that's our road. Uh, this is the Chinese road. This is Bhutan here. And all this is Bhutan. And uh, this, as I said, is the area which uh, China contests. That's just by way of illustration. So now, uh, when they tried to extend that road, uh, two companies of uh, uh, you know, Indian soldiers driving bulldozers came down on that uh, uh, area and uh, blocked that road construction activity. And that is what the crisis was all about. And uh, on June 30th, the Indians issued a statement saying that the, the stand was motivated by the need to assist Bhutan, but also its security. So we were very upfront on the fact that our we felt that our security was affected by uh, that move to build that road. And as I explained to you, that ridge, a uh, very sensitive ridge, it kind of, it, uh, it looks down uh, on the, the, in, uh, the area, very sensitive area of India, which I will show you. Now, for a long time, the tri-junction between Sikkim, Bhutan, and India was a matter of contention. But it was fairly peaceful. There were some minor uh, transgressions, 2007, 2012. Uh, there were some crises. Uh, nothing else came out. My own view is that the Chinese action was actually linked to Bhutan. And the, the uh, idea was Bhutan and India-Bhutan relations. 
In the past decade, China has concluded that its border negotiations with Bhutan are not going anywhere. China and Bhutan dispute their entire, the entire border is disputed. They've been trying to negotiate it uh, since the 1990s, but they don't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, the issue is not so much Bhutan, but I think the growing belief that with economic, uh, with its growing economic dominance, the time has come for China to establish its regional primacy. Uh, when I say regional primacy, so it means whether you say Asia Pacific area, whether you say Central Asia, and then of course South Asia, because China is a major neighbor of South Asia. And so they're trying to, uh, uh, because if you want to become a world power, as Xi Jinping recently said that China wanted to become, uh, you first got to be a regional power. And then, so there is a certain uh, logic um, uh, out there. But in South Asia, the big problem is Bhutan, because Bhutan has a special relationship with India. It has uh, ties with China, but there is no Chinese embassy in uh, Bhutan. So th the, this, this is a bit irksome to China. I mean, so they have a, a lot of Chinese tourists are now uh, going to Bhutan. Uh, Chinese calculations in Bhutan, are both by way of, as I said, of being a, a major player in South Asia, as well as the fact that Bhutan is also a, uh, uh, has a Tibetan culture, and it has some impact on the Tibetan, um, uh, uh, you know, on, on Tibet itself and the future of, of Tibet. So that's the, uh, now the Chinese, of course, dismiss. They say that the Bhutanese don't own that area, that Doklam area. They say that area belongs to China. India is the villain of the peace. I was in Beijing in August, and there was a, a very smart uh, Chinese foreign ministry official, Wong Wenlin, and she said that the Bhutanese have said that they don't, you know, that they don't really, they had not invited the Indians, and that um, uh, the area where the Indians had intervened was not Bhutanese territory. So the Chinese say that, you know, the Bhutanese, uh, and the Bhutanese have been very, very uh, circumspect, and I may say so, but the Bhutanese did formally protest on June 29th, there was a formal protest uh, launched. Now, of course, if there had been, uh, if this crisis had erupted into war, uh, it would not have been so much over the Doklam issue. The border would have been an occasion for the conflict that has been building up for a while, not the cause. Such a war would, of course, be extremely strange, because as I, uh, as I told you, that this invasion, the so-called invasion uh, out here, uh, is from this ridge here, down here, is 100 meters. And I, this is what I told uh, my Chinese interlocutors. I said, you are, uh, and the, the, uh, several PLA officers who I met in Beijing, and they said, you know, uh, you Indians must withdraw. If you don't withdraw, we will compel you to withdraw. And it's a very tough language indeed uh, in August at that time. So I told them, I said, look, uh, it would be really strange if you go to war over an invasion of 100 meters by your own statement. It's not our statement. You said that Indians had come in 100 to 180 meters. So, but then, uh, subsequently, of course, as you know, that the, the crisis has, uh, has died down. And uh, uh, as of now, uh, there is status quo ante, meaning the Chinese have stopped their old construction. We are back up the 100 meters up that ridge. And uh, I think you know the the India and China, as you know, have many unresolved issues between them, and I think one of the first and foremost is their entire border, which China sometimes very deviously says is 2,000 kilometers, whereas the Indians say it is 4,057 kilometers. So, but the Chinese never give an explanation as to why they say it's 2,000 kilometers, but our surmise is that it is because they completely they ignore the western border completely. They, rec they say that Jammu and Kashmir is disputed. That's uh, not an uh, immediate issue uh, between us. But whatever it is, the Chinese keep shifting goalposts all the time. That's one feature of their um, behavior out there. But I think the greater reason for a possible outbreak of Sino-Indian uh, conflict or war, if indeed that occurs, will be their differing perceptions of themselves and their place in the world. In the 1950s, as you're aware, India was pitched as the great democratic hope of the free world against uh, communist China. Today, the rise of both countries, with India maybe a decade and a half behind China, has given this conflict a new kind of a twist. 
China is seeking, as I said, China is seeking uh, regional preeminence, increasingly challenges India in the South Asia and the Indian Ocean region. This is not something that happened suddenly. It has come with the steady growth of Chinese economic muscle around the world and in this uh, region. The Chinese find that they're, uh, often they find that their economic clout far exceeds their military clout. They have a, uh, the, the uh, and they believe that at some point this has to catch up. But to reach that state of being a true gl global power, they must have a neighborhood which is benign. In other words, they must establish regional primacy, as I told you, as a precondition. Now, so far in South Asia, they have followed a very convenient model uh, of offsetting India's advantages by backing Pakistan to the hilt. Given their enhanced clout in South Asia and the fact that their economy is five times that of India and its military considerably stronger, they are seeking a situation where India either accepts Chinese primacy or is subdued through Chinese uh, politico-military uh, policy uh, in the South Asian and Indian Ocean region. This seems to be to be their kind of long-term uh, pattern. However, of course, India has its own sense of self-worth uh, in the global scheme of things, and accepting Chinese primacy in its neighborhood is not uh, part of this. And so it's seeking to offset Chinese power through growing proximity to the United States and Japan, who have their own reasons to keep uh, China in check. Now, ever since Mr. Modi came to power, India has taken significant steps to come closer to both these two countries, China and Japan. Of course, to some extent, this is a bit of a dangerous game because it actually feeds into Beijing's belief that these three countries are conspiring to stifle the Chinese dream. It's, 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 uh, it is uh, uh, something which must be looked at with a little bit of caution. Of course, in India's case, yes, India has maybe sometimes uh, an inflated view of its own uh, place in the world. But India cannot escape the fact that its military modernization remains stuck and its economy is yet to get into the promised high growth path. You need these two things if, if, if you have to deter China. The Modi government has the political support to make the kind of reforms that could change things. Or if things don't work out, that actually pushes us towards the United States, towards the formal alliance maybe uh, with the United States. And as uh, a leading scholar of uh, China and Sino-Indian relations, John Garber pointed out recently that it might actually make sense for China to teach India a lesson before China's advantage is eroded. That's what Garber said, meaning this, this could be a factor in the conflict. Now, of course, what the Doklam crisis has done is that it has torpedoed the work of special representatives who are trying to resolve the Sino-Indian border we don't have the full picture, but you know there was a consensus on the uh, the special representatives had an 18-point consensus through which, if they had been given the political direction, they could have resolved the border issue. What has also happened is that the Doklam crisis shows that all the confidence-building measures that had been put in place since 1993 somehow don't seem to be working. Every decade we have a new confidence-building measure. It's like you know a little bit in the South China Sea you have the declaration of code of conduct and then you have the code of conduct and then you have something else and it keeps on um, uh, it somehow doesn't uh, resolve the issue now of course uh, I'm told that after a gap of a year the special representatives will meet uh, maybe next month or the month after that uh, the person who is heading the Chinese side is Yang Jiche who has just been elevated to the Politburo and may, might become the vice premier of China that means become even more powerful but the Chinese, uh, you know, the, 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 despite the fact that this is a very remote area for China, this is an area where the Chinese are focused. And this was best brought out recently. On October 21st, you know, China had its, uh, uh, the, the Chinese 19th Party Congress ended. On October 29th, the Chinese press had this fascinating item which said that Xi Jinping had replied to a letter written to him by a family of two her family of a man, a herder, and his two uh, children, daughters. And these herders had written to him, congratulating him for the Congress, etc. So Xi Jinping wrote back to them, and this letter was released on October 29th, that I would like to thank you for safeguarding the sovereignty of China, because you're living in this remote area, you're doing a great job, etc., etc. 
So to me, it appeared like a signal. That it's a signal that the Tibet border is something which is very much in the minds of the Chinese leadership. And the reason why it happens, I can understand that because, as Aparna said, we both come from the mountain areas. In the remote, in the northern part of the mountain area, it's a very difficult and terrible area. You have a bit of a depopulation going on. Because when it's, it's, the Chinese are, uh, 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 economy is doing well, uh, Chinese are becoming richer, so Indians, Indians are also doing slightly well. So why the hell should you live in that godforsaken area? So you quietly drift out, you migrate, and so the, soon there's no one living there except the army. And so I think there is um, a pressure on both sides uh, to try and get people to live, work there. I just want to put the future context before you. Uh, since the uh, 1990s, India's relations with China have worked along four Cs, conflict, cooperation, con competition, and containment. At any given moment, there's a salience of one or the other. So we know what conflict is all about. We've had the 62 war. We've just seen the Doklam uh, uh, standoff. Cooperation is manifested in both uh, India's membership of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, of the BRICS, the so-called BRICS Bank, New Development Bank, India's membership of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Here we are actually, and many multilateral fora, we are cooperating with China. So the one is conflict, then is cooperation. Competition is for regional influence in the South Asia Indian Ocean uh, region. Chinese economic clout has already knocked out India from Central Asia. Now Chinese are stepping up their efforts in the South Asian and Indian Ocean region. There are not too many options for India, but closer collaboration with Japan is one of them. And that is happening. The most recent manifestation has been the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, which was launched in March this year. Uh, the idea is to develop quality infrastructure in Africa, along with maritime digital connectivity. And this is linked to the notion of the free Indo-Pacific uh, region. So the, the uh, way they, they are looking at it is that we have, can provide an alternative. And as Secretary Tillerson spoke about predatory economic policies of China, so this grouping hopes to provide non-predatory, I hope, uh, you know, sort of economic assistance. In South Asia, at least, uh, India is blessed by geography, in the sense that if you look at Nepal or Bangladesh or, or, or Bhutan, they have very few options other than India, meaning I'm, it, it has nothing to do with me, it has nothing to do with India, it has to do with geography. That they, the, so Indians have some uh, leeway out there. Containment, this is the uh, fourth C, is in the minds of both India and China. New Delhi believes that Beijing is seeking to contain it in South Asia, whereas China believes that we are, trying to, we are becoming part of a US-led containment strategy in Asia. Now, as I said, Doklam didn't trigger a large, uh, larger conflict, but the trend line is not heartening. And it uh, seems to suggest that we may just end up kicking the can down the road, as far as Doklam is concerned. Powerful China may best India. This is what I told the Chinese in Beijing, that you may best us in a military conflict, but I can assure you, if we go down, we'll take you with us. Which means, which means that the Indian dream will go, but so will the Chinese dream. Because two large countries of our size simply cannot afford to think in terms of uh, uh, maybe skir skirmishes and things like that, but surely not conflict. Now, from the Indian point of view, what we need to do stares us in the face. First, we need to carry out deep and systematic reform of the armed forces, which has been uh, on the line suggested by the group of ministers in 2002 and the Narish Chandra Committee in 2012. This will provide the country with the wherewithal to deter a China which has successfully bitten the bullet on military reform. So we started military reform before China, but we, our reform seemed to be stuck. You know, Second, India needs to a genuine good neighbor policy. I think sometimes with Nepal or with uh, Bhutan or with uh, Bangladesh, we tend to over-securitize our um, uh, you know, relations. And I think we need, to, we need to be a bit careful on that. Third, and of course, this is, of course, the most important, we've got to get our economic policy act together. India has wasted much of this decade, which was meant to be this takeoff decade. Even now, instead of focusing on reforming economic policy and governance structures, the government tends, the Modi government tends to be caught up in the cycle of elections, meaning, or electoral 
uh, obsessed by winning the next election, you know, but and not doing the hard stuff that is needed for reforming uh, the government system or the governance uh, uh, system. They, there is a tendency on the part of the Modi government to look for silver bullets, you know, like demonetization that we will one sweep we will uh, we will transform India or the goods and services tax and things like that. So I think we really need to uh, sober up, in, uh, if I may put it uh, that way, uh, if we need uh, to confront this challenge, which is a very substantial challenge uh, on the uh, part of China, because which has a very skillful leadership, which has a very determined leadership, which already has a huge lead uh, over us. So I'll conclude here, and then we can. Uh... Um, I really like to draw you out on a few things you said. First is um, you were in uh, in China in August, and you have followed the 19th uh, Party Congress and written extensively on it. Um, what are some of the key takeaways with respect to how China will behave? You mentioned regional primacy, but if I could ask you to sort of elaborate a little more, I mean, how does China see um, South Asia playing into it, or South China Sea, or United States? How does it see? these countries playing into what it desires in the next five to ten years under President Xi? Well, one is uh, what we have seen uh, in the case of Pakistan. It has uh, become an important part of the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese have uh, offered huge investments uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan, investment in the energy sector, investment in the, uh, in the uh, connectivity sector. Uh, if you look at uh, Bangladesh, last year when uh, President Xi Jinping was in uh, Bangladesh, uh, he uh, offered $24 billion worth of investments, which was several times more than what India had an offer. Likewise, in Nepal, the Chinese investment is steadily rising. And, and so the Ch Chinese have a huge amount of uh, money on offer which uh, to construct in, uh, infrastructure in these various countries. Whereas in the case of India, the big uh, uh, the, uh, what the Chinese have been successful in is that they have already transformed their own country the in, infrastructure wise now if, if India's problem is that if you start offering money to others for infrastructure the Indians are going to say hey, what about me meaning what about back home first you got to do this and then uh, you're welcome to do that but as I said uh, India is partnering trying to partner with Japan Japan's an important partner uh, for us uh, in uh, many of these um, uh, areas. And uh, perhaps we can come up with a coherent model. Here I must say that the, you know, President uh, Trump was in uh, uh, Asia and uh, he also spoke of uh, various things. I mean, the newspapers today have him uh, say grand things about that visit. The uh, problem is that America doesn't have money, meaning America has no money to put up. So it's one thing for Mr. Tillerson to say that you know we uh, that the, we oppose predatory financing and things like that. It's it's quite another thing to say, hey, when the African uh, and Asian countries say, uh, you know, at least the Chinese have built the railroad uh, for me or a roadway road for me. Uh, what do you have an offer? So rhetoric is not enough. There's no substitute. So there must be some kind of a more coherent. Uh, economic policy answer in the sense that uh, Trump's visit to Asia had a lot on the security part of it. So he spoke about North Korea, he spoke about the, uh, appeared to be more muscular in the South China Sea issue, uh, etc. But as far as the economic policy con is concerned, it was America first in the sense he had great deals, $250 billion worth of deals with uh, the Chinese. But that, don't, that doesn't really solve the problem of the coalition and allies and others uh, who are confronting uh, you know, increasing Chinese uh, assertiveness. And this assertiveness comes in pretty tough ways in the sense the South Koreans set up the third, uh, third missile system. And the Chinese reacted by, by cutting off the flow of tourists and also this Lotte company you know, which has been driven to the ground in China. So the message is very clear. The message is very clear, you know, that um, you, if you guys don't behave, we have ways of dealing with you. So I'll follow up with that and ask you. Um, Secretary Tillerson spoke of a 100-year relationship with India. Um, coming up just a few days after 
the discussion about the quad. And you wrote a recent piece in which you were a little skeptical about the quad. And I'll quote you. Mooted as an alliance of democracies, it seeks to upend everything we know about international relations, where the drivers are national interests rather than values. With so many people actually in this city, in Delhi, Tokyo, Canberra, thrilled about the quad, why are you so skeptical? Well, you know, as I said, that, that when countries have national interests, okay, and in national interests, this business of shared values, etc., is, is, is uh, a bit over the top. And I, if you remember, I gave you the example of World War II. I said World War II was an alliance of a, of a partial democracy, which is the United States, of an imperial power, Britain, and a communist power, uh, so, Soviet Union, against the evil of Nazi Germany. So each one had interests. It was not shared values. So likewise, when we have seen uh, we have seen uh, um, uh, foreign policy, you know, sort of uh, unfold. Let us say in South Asia, if we we Indians have seen that the United States was an ally of Pakistan in the uh, which was a military dictatorship. You see, so there was no uh, shared values there. The shared values should have had U.S. and India uh, on one side. So I'm saying I'm not complaining. All I'm trying to say is that the reality is that nations pursue their interests. Nations pursue their interests. And out here, I'm not able to see, because uh, uh, Japan uh, has a, faces an existential threat from North Korea. Not India ha doesn't face that threat. Japan has to be focused completely on North Korea. Likewise, Australia, I'm, I'm not sure. So it's separated by a huge ocean from everyone uh, else. And uh, Australia might want to be part of the American uh, drive in the Pacific Ocean. But you know, we have a disputed border with China. If pressure builds up on the border, no one's going to come to uh, assist us. And no one can assist us. And I don't think uh, India should expect that. But you know, we don't have an identity of views on these things. Japan doesn't recognize the uh, Jammu and Kashmir as being part of India. Neither does the United States. So if you, if you have so many differences um, uh, in, on basic issues, you know, uh, what kind of a quad, what does it mean? And my principal argument always uh, has been that India's foremost external interests are the Persian Gulf, Northern Arabian Sea region. Why? Because 70% of our oil comes from there. If that oil is disrupted for even a week, you know, there's crisis in Delhi. There's chaos in Delhi, I shouldn't say crisis. So 70% of our oil comes from the Persian Gulf and uh, the Arabian Sea. Seven million of our citizens work there, remitting $35 billion annually to the country. No comparable area in the uh, Southeast Asia or, uh, or other part uh, exists. And the strange thing is that the US wants us to collaborate, cooperate, et cetera, in that region, but we have no conversation in the other region. There's zero conversation on what is happening there, primarily because the division has been on the basis of military uh, divisions. So uh, the Pacific, we deal with the Pacific Command when it comes to Asia Pacific, and uh, the CENTCOM, uh, we, we have no dealings. So I think this is not a particularly effective way of creating that 100-year friendship, because you need to be upfront on many of these issues. And I don't think we've reached that stage. Um, I have more questions, but I'll actually allow others to ask questions. Um, please wait for the microphone to come to you and identify yourself and your affiliation. Um, uh, Polly, uh, the lady. You may have to tell me because sometimes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Polly Nayak. I'm an independent consultant in Washington. And I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit, if you would, on um, your what I understood to be your statement that China had already beaten out India in Central Asia. Um, I just came back. Did I understand you correctly? That, that China was. Um, had, had pushed India out of its options in Central Asia. 
The reason I'm asking is I just spent a couple of weeks in Central Asia in the five independent republics, and my impression was that actually China has its nose in there, but not much more, that a lot of what I am seeing there is actually Russian, including some of the infrastructure building. So I just wanted to ask you to unfold that, if you would, please. I'm just going by the figures we have of investments in aid. So if you look at that, India is not a player anymore. Our investments may not exceed a billion dollars in all those states. Chinese are 50 billion, you know, investment and aid. And Chinese own a significant proportion of the national debts of many of those countries. And by the very fact of the pipelines, the three, four pipelines, oil and gas pipelines they have built, they have changed the economic face of that area, railroads. But, you know, when you point to Russia, it's interesting because the point is the Chinese have been very careful to defer to Russia. But if you recollect that I think maybe a year and a half or two years ago, the Russians in turn said that the Eurasian Economic Union and China will coordinate policy. So the, the problem is, uh, Russia's problem is the shrinkage of Russia's uh, kind of external uh, ability to, you know, the so Russians are very good. They can go and drop bombs in Syria. But I'm not so sure that they have uh, the capacity, you know, to maintain their uh, primacy, as it were, uh, in Central Asia. I Meaning I think that is under uh, uh, siege primarily because the Chinese have moved in a big way. And this is just the beginning. I Meaning what they are doing in the uh, Kazakhstan, China, uh, Xinjiang border, the kind of construction uh, in those areas uh, is quite fascinating. This is just the beginning. No, I, I, I certainly take your point, and I'm not, uh, I wouldn't argue any of the points you've made except to say that culturally Russia's influence is so dominant. Uh, and I did see evidence of, uh, of the tension between uh, Russia and China over um, uh, agreements that have to do with uh, pipelines, et cetera. But I, I really, I think there's quite a lot of tension, actually, and that deference hasn't uh, taken any form that uh, is sufficient in the eyes of, of the Russians. So I just, I just had to bring that up. I do think you're right over time that Chinese are buying Central Asia. Well, no, I don't, you know, basic, the, my basic point is Russia has shot itself in the foot. And when it's getting into, uh, when uh, uh, it, is, it is in fairly straightened circumstances for reasons of its own creation. And uh, so right now it's on a defensive mode, for example, by preventing the change of gauge of the railroads. Okay, So you're able to block off. That is the historic Russian strategy. We'll have our own railway gauge. And so the other guy can't come. But if you see what they have done in that uh, Khorgos, it takes a train 40 minutes to transfer the containers from uh, a Chinese train onto the Russian train and be off towards the Polish border. So there are some remarkable things happening there. It's true that, you see, when we talk of big powers, China, India, uh, United States, etc., uh, you have to also hand it to the smaller powers who use their tension for their own, uh, to their own advantage. You know, I would say whether it is Nepal or whether it's Sri Lanka, uh, in the case of India, uh, whether it is uh, some Central Asian republics, um, that's fair game. They are there. They say that if the Chinese are willing to come and put in money, who am I to complain? No? Uh, second. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, two basic questions. One is uh, from the cultural standpoint of view, is that China or India or Pakistan, do they have a real significant change from their traditional uh, uh, kind of attitude or uh, family value, ethic value? The second is about the uh, current event, about uh, climate change. Uh, India and China, do they have a real cooperation or really fight each other uh, from the standpoint of a renewable energy or non-renewable one? Do they have any competition? Okay. 
I think I think that um, you know the uh, the most sensible thing is for these large countries because as I said that when you have when you're nuclear armed states and when you talk so easily of conflict and war it's a very dangerous uh, kind of uh, road that you're going down to. so it is definitely uh, a um, these countries can cooperate and if you look at various policy issues if you look at let's say Pakistan and India uh, there have been points in time where we've been very fairly close to having breakthroughs in our relationship likewise with China on the border issue uh, which is the real problem uh, we have been having talks and we again are pretty close but the, the the there are issues which are more intangible in the sense when you talk of when uh, let's say when when a country looks at its future when it's looking at uh, issues of primacy hegemony etc uh, these are much more difficult to pin down what is the country's national goal you know, so the, if the if, if the country, if uh, as Xi Jinping says that I, China will come to the center stage by 2050, so you know countries like India worry. Meaning, if it's the, if China comes to the center stage, how, where do we get pushed uh, at that point? So there are, uh, uh, as I said, the intangibles which are more difficult to lay your hands on. But certainly, I think that my own view, my own personal view, uh, is that that that. Uh, what Xi Jinping also often speaks of, the so-called win-win formulation, uh, is something which needs to be actually win-win, meaning it needs to be actually laid out, and it's possible. It's not impossible. The point is the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of thinking uh, where uh, which realists say, or which uh, defensive realists uh, like Mir Shimer and others say, that there is really no alternative. Great powers will clash. Great powers will. Uh, there is a fight for privacy, and um, so I'm not sure. I'm 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 kind of uh, open uh, in my mind to that, but I certainly think that, uh, uh, for example, in my own country, I have opposed uh, uh, our government's view on the one belt one road. I think that what India should take advantage of the belt and road initiative, and uh, cherry pick it, just like others are cherry picking it. They should cherry pick it instead of saying no, no, no. We um, uh, we we oppose it. So likewise, I think Pakistan uh, should also, in its own interest, open its uh, uh, economy to the larger South Asian economy, because Pakistani economy is not going anywhere unless it's open. It opens up to the South Asian economy because South Asia means uh, Afghanistan, India, uh, and this vast region. And in this, uh, the the Pakistanis have certain natural advantages. Indians have certain natural advantages, but if Pakistan start thinking that opening up means that I'll be finished, you know, that I'll be destroyed, then it's a bit of a problem. So, but they have, unfortunately, uh, we have been waiting for more than a decade for Pakistan to give India most favored nation uh, status. So despite commitments, it hasn't, they haven't, it hasn't really come through. Because you have a very powerful clique in Pakistan that uh, does not allow that. But if you talk to Pakistani businessmen, they would love to open up and do business with India because they know they can earn a lot of money out of it. Hi, um, Seema Sirohi. Uh, I'm a columnist for the Economic Times. Manoj, I wanted to ask you about Doklam, what the present situation is, because there's some who say that the Chinese are back exactly uh, where they were and that uh, the agreement, quote unquote, was just to allow the summit to take place. And my other questions about the Quad, not to push you too much on it, um, the point is, um, what other option does India have? I mean, it has to get in some sort of fencing mode with other countries. It's not in a position to um, send signals or do anything to China on its own as yet. So what we are doing is, uh, OK, we don't have shared values or uh, it's containment by another name, or at least strategic fencing, one could argue. Well, to start with your second question first, you know, India, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have to tell you, India is a very huge country. It's got a very huge military. It's a nuclear weapon state. So it does not face any existential threat 
from China. Because in a nuclear thing, existential threats are become mutual. So we are not, we are in this. You uh, uh, just replace uh, India with China when it was dealing with the erstwhile Soviet Union. So yes, of course, it reached out to the U.S., but it did not expect the U.S. to defend it between 1980 and 19 or 2000. Uh, the U.S. and China were pretty close. I say between 1980 and 19, 1971 and 1990, U.S. and China were very close. And they, they were uh, oriented against the erstwhile uh, Soviet Union. But they were not military allies. The China did not expect the U.S. to come to its military aid. They didn't need to. They, were, they had enough. So likewise, I don't think we need military... Uh, uh, alliance, you know, with uh, with anyone. I think we we can take care of ourselves in that uh, in in those circumstances. But yes, as I pointed out in my presentation, we have been lackadaisical in reforming our military system. We started off in 2002. We're going not reach anywhere. Whereas China started off in 2013 or so, um, uh, this particular phase, and they are now by 2020 they would have completed it and with pretty drastic um, uh, reform. As far as Doklam is concerned, uh, you know there is uh, there is um, uh, I can I can if you can just uh, show me that uh, map again and I'll explain to you. So first of all, I didn't show you this earlier. This is the position. Here is the uh, here is the Chinese. This is Chumbi Valley, and this is Doklam out here. So now the. Uh, the the uh, issue is that first of all, this Chumbi Valley. Many people say it's a dagger in the, uh, pointed towards India because this, we have this narrow neck here. This is Bangladesh. So this is just about 40 kilometers, even narrower out here, 40 kilometers. So this and there's a rail. Uh, this connects to the northeast northeastern part of India. So that's why India is very sensitive about this uh, area, uh, uh, this uh, Doklam area. But if you look at it another way. If you see Indian positions here in northern Sikkim, this across this, uh, it's a plateau area, it's a flat area. We have got armor out here, which we put in 1986-87. We can cut off this area, and that's what we intend to do. Meaning militarily, this area can be cut off. Actually, the Chinese are very vulnerable here. It's a very narrow area. If you can show me the uh, other map, that uh, no, the, yeah, this one. So if you see this. The, uh, the Indians occupy the heights on the side, on the ridge. This is all, these are all the heights. This, this is the watershed. The, the border goes along the watershed. So the, the Chinese are in this narrow um, uh, area. They are, in fact, vulnerable. Our problem is this ridge. Because once you come to that ridge, then you are overlooking that whole Siliguri corridor. And that's what makes it sensitive for us. And that's the uh, basis of contention. And now they say that the, the, uh, this was the point where this road construction thing. So they are now back to uh, w where they were, and we are back up here. We are back 100 meters, meaning we, are just up, we just walked up. We are 100 meters up there. They've gone back. They have forces here, but this is part of China. You can't complain if they are uh, there. But they are also aware that these forces there are actually vulnerable because you know the, all this uh, uh, area is controlled by us. The big worry, of course, if you look at it from from kind of military logic point of view, is that the Chinese could simply walk into Bhutan, and Bhutan doesn't have the state capacity to defend itself and and outflank uh, uh, you know all of India. But that's a uh, you know those kind of scenarios uh, can be uh, can take you anywhere. But you know so if it's war, like it's like World War uh, One, World War Two, walk into Belgium, walk into uh, this thing, you bypass the uh, the defenses. So I don't, uh, as I said, the, uh, to think of those kind of things, you're talking of, of war, even with a capital W, meaning if you do these huge movements. And I can't see uh, whether India or China, uh, you know, kind of contemplating something like that. Right at the back, corner. Roger, Co my name is Roger Cochetti. I work uh, with uh, private equity in the technology sector, but my question really has to do with something you've mentioned in passing. Um, you've talked about uh, Japan and the United States and a number of other countries 
Well, but could you expand a little bit on what, if any, role Russia plays in this conflict? Because clearly they had uh, been a close military, close military cooperation with India in the past, and many people felt that the arrangement between the Soviet Union and India was intended to be pointed towards China, and many people felt the relationship between China and Pakistan was intended to be pointed towards India. And also, you've said almost nothing about Europe. I don't know. That may be for very good reason that there is nothing to say about Europe in the context of this conflict, but is there anything to say about Russia and uh, Europe in this discussion? Thank you. Well, uh, in, in, in this uh, Doklam, China, this kind of a thing, one of the most uh, worrying things in the last, since the, the whole uh, Ukraine crisis began, has been the fact that this has steadily pushed Russia towards China. And this is something which we constantly uh, keep on telling uh, the Americans and we tell the Europeans that to we are between a rock and a hard place on this because we had this favored uh, defense technology uh, relationship with Russia. What the Russians have given us, meaning uh, the Americans aren't even thinking about, uh, aren't even contemplating anything equivalent. Meaning the Russians have given us the technology to build a nuclear propelled submarine. They have given us a supersonic uh, cruise missile, uh, which is now formed the prominent part of our defense uh, uh, system. The Sukhoi aircraft, that our fighter lead, our principal fighter aircraft, is the Russian version, which is superior to what they have given to the Chinese. But now, slowly, and, and you know, they, uh, the uh, uh, the Russians know one thing that one thing which we have not done is to cheat them on this, in the sense we've done no reverse engineering. So we, we have not uh, reverse engineered anything, and whereas, you know, the Chinese have. And this is something, but you know, the, uh, since the U Ukraine crisis began, uh, what has happened, it, it kind of coincides with the fact that oil prices also uh, went down, and Russia was, uh, was in a difficult situation, uh, and so it's been, um, the, it's been steadily pushed uh, towards China. And so now when the Chinese are buying some of the, um, uh, their cutting edge um, uh, equipment, et cetera, so Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese also have the capacity to reverse engineer. They, they have reached, they have a, they've made it into a fine art. They, they have the, uh, the wherewithal, the laboratories and the technology, uh, you know, sort of uh, groups which are able to take up a system and probably, you know, kind of take it apart and come up with something or the other, which we uh, completely lack. So far, now the problem with India and Russia is that our relations are very anemic, economic relations are extremely anemic. I think our trade is piffling, meaning uh, $10 billion or something like that, which is, uh, so, meaning that the relationship doesn't really have substance. There is, there is there is a congruence of there's a uh, congruence of views and ideas etc meaning uh, we see uh, the russians have been very helpful to us uh, for example in whenever the issue of kashmir came up in the united nations we knew that the russian uh, veto would be there for us see but you know that world is changing because the russians are feeling the pressure and uh, what they say is look you guys are going with the united states so uh, if you guys are going to, to go with the United States, then you can't expect to keep us as close to you. See? And then, of course, as I said, that the relationship is anemic. It can't be only on the basis of a close uh, uh, of defense ties. Like, we've had ties with the United States. So even when there were no defense ties, we had reasonably good ties because we have other areas of uh, a good relationship, including the fact that we have a huge diaspora here, and uh, amongst other things. So all that has helped. In, uh, so that texture is not there in that relationship. Now, you can have futuristic plans, for example, the International North-South Transportation Corridor, uh, which is supposed to uh, link West Indian por ports in the western coast of India uh, to Bandarabas and Iran, and all the way up to the Baltic ports and to the Russian railway system. But you know, you've got to have goods to export or import. So you can build that connectivity, but there are no goods to, 
export or import. So that relationship, as I said, uh, uh, is a problem. Now, uh, uh, the Russians know that from the existential point of view, their biggest worry is China. Because we have the, all of Eastern, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, Russia, which is where the population is uh, very, very thin. And as compared to um, uh, what China has on offer, uh, so w when you look at this whole pattern, now, you know, and you mentioned Europe, so I've also spoken to Europeans about. But you know, the Europeans are fixated on the European issue. In the sense, you have now uh, Sweden is uh, thinking of reinstating conscription. Finland already has conscription. They are, all of them are steadily raising their um, uh, defense budgets. The Baltic states are very worried. They're sweating. Uh, they, they worry because of the pattern of behavior that we have seen coming out of um, uh, uh, from Russia. So they, uh, you know, from their point of view, they they try to uh, they, they they try their their aim is to curb Russian uh, tendencies, you know, the hybrid warfare and that kind of stuff. Uh, so they don't see our problem. <laughs> our problem is that the, the Russians grow closer to China, China gets access to certain technologies, because for a long time, the Indian Air Force had an edge over the uh, Chinese. I, mean, I would say even today, because the Chinese haven't yet got their fifth generation aircraft uh, in service. But when you come to the Sukhois, we are, we are ahead of them. They may have some numbers, but our, the quality of our Air Force uh, is superior. But that edge is going. That edge is going. Likewise, I think naval vessels, uh, etc. Um, because of the equipment we we, we uh, carry on them, we still have the edge. But you know, numbers are now uh, the Chinese numbers are uh, playing up. Chinese quality um, has been improving. Plus, they're having access to the Russian um, uh, Russian uh, technology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zoe. I'm with Stimson. I was wondering now that this standoff's been over for a while. Do you see any qualitative shift in how Beijing perceives India, in, especially in terms of Indian resolve? Most of climate view, how, how does Beijing look at India? Is there a bit of, you know, India stood up? OK, well, you know, that's an uh, interesting uh, question. Because you know, as I told you, I was there in August in Beijing. And I was given all this hardline stuff about, you know, you guys, uh, unless you guys do this, we'll do this, etc. And then suddenly, when the agreement took place, the 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 uh, tone has changed. So, and here and now, I'm being more of a journalist and hazarding uh, a guess more than uh, specific knowledge. The my own view is that I think that in Beijing there is um, uh, there is a certain amount of you know there's a dilemma about how to deal with India. See. And, and of course, I don't want to um, uh, sound needlessly, you know, kind of uh, speculative on this. But you know, as they say that the Chinese view of the world, you have this kind of hierarchical relations. So the Chinese uh, have uh, what they come to the U.S. and they say, "Well, let's have a, uh, the new type of great power relations." With, so they tell the U.S., "We can do a condominium of sorts, in the sense that if you can divide the Pacific at an equitable point." You respect us, we'll respect you, uh, etc. And so the question that we've been asking, and I asked this in Beijing three years ago when this thing first came up, was uh, does India figure in that great power typology? You know, are we also part of the? It's a, I didn't get a clear answer on that. Now, the thing is that if you look at the smaller states, there Beijing is very clear that you guys, you you should know your place. And I think that um, last year they issued this, I think, a document on Asia Pacific. Um, uh, I, I'm a bit, my memory a bit hazy on that. They had a, a document on uh, their policy in the Asia Pacific, and where they actually had a line saying that the smaller power should stay out of the way. They should stay out of the way. Now the problem is that India is not a smaller power, so you can. You have a certain view of where Pakistan ought to be. So OK, you want aid, we'll give it to you, Sri Lanka, et cetera. Now, what do you do with India? Because even historically, uh, India was never, India was, India didn't come in the barbarian category. See, the, the, uh, the, uh, the West 
was in the barbarian category. Everyone else was subordinate, you know. And the, there was really no place for India. Because there was also the thing is that uh, uh, India had also, uh, Buddhism had come from India, many other influences had come from India, so they had also received things from India. So it was not, a, it was not as though it was Chinese munificence going out, outwards. So even, so if you translate it into today's situation, they really have not been able to figure out how to deal with India. So they, uh, so one part out there says that, you know, push these guys hard. We'll use Pakistan, we'll use Nepal, we'll push these guys hard. But I think another part of the system says, if you push them too hard, they're going to fall into the laps of the Americans. And then we are in trouble. You know, let's not, uh, let's, let's take it easy. So my feeling is there is, there is this uh, duality, there is this tension uh, in, in their uh, uh, India policy, which is not quite resolved. So sometimes you have absolute, uh, you know, sweetness and honey when you're talking to the ambassador and he has nice things and, um, you know, uh, how we can get along together, how, the, you know, you can shape the destiny of on what uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, told Rajiv Gandhi, you know, uh, all that kind of nice stuff. But on the st other side, you have something else where the Chinese worry about Tibet, about the succession, the Dalai Lama succession, etc., uh, where they are nervous about, about what will happen there. What about um, moving away from land for a moment to the ocean and the uh, Chinese building a port north of Karachi? Now, they talk about it in the context of the Middle East, but it also has implications for the Indian Ocean. And also another neighbor, Sri Lanka. And uh, Sri Lanka is so important to shipping. Um, what, I mean, it may not be appropriate for India to try to get too much closer to Sri Lanka, but is there any other third party in that sort of Australia, New Zealand, um, Malaysia, somebody who's, because the Chinese do have a big influence in Sri Lanka. You know, the, uh, Sri Lanka again comes into their old typology because Zhang He, you know, had come to Sri Lanka. He was involved in a war uh, that happened in uh, Sri Lanka. So the Chinese see Sri Lanka as a natural place where they, uh, they, have a, uh, uh, they have a point of view with regard to Sri Lanka. Uh, incidentally, not many people know that Nepal was also a tributary of China, meaning they, they pay tribute to um, China. So they, when, they, when the Chinese look at this, they look at it in a very different way. So where Sri Lanka is concerned, uh, in the Indian Ocean region, uh, I think the Chinese have, are working along. Uh, they, on one hand, you see, when they look at their, the, what's called the so-called Malacca dilemma, that is that a very substantive portion of Chinese imports, particularly oil, has to go through the Malaccas. And when they look at the map, who do they see sitting at the head of the Malaccas? It's India. And so they are, they, the, so as I said, this thing is a dual, a duality. You know, they worry about India. At the same time, they don't know what to do about India. So when it comes to Sri Lanka, I think uh, the, uh, uh, what they started off when they built the, the port at Hambantota, which incidentally was offered to India before uh, the Chinese took it up. Uh, I think they just kind of looked at it in a kind of a mechanical way that, you know, you look at Hambantota and then you look at the world sea lanes, which are going right by Hambantota, uh, very important uh, area. But since Hambantota has opened, no one's going there. It's the, and now uh, the, the airport that they have, the Chinese have built, uh, there's talk that the Indians may take it, Indian company might um, take it over. Uh, but I don't think the Chinese didn't realize that a lot of, Sri Lanka's uh, maritime prosperity comes from the fact that it's the transshipment point for Indian cargo. So all the uh, so all the heavy cargo comes in ships to Colombo, transshipped into because the point is that Indians in our own way have not built a decent port where we can <laughs> where we can receive these uh, heavy ships. So Colombo's prosperity depends on India. So periodically, of course, Chinese have these games. They are like uh, 
they, they, they indirectly threaten Singapore because they have this big, big uh, development in Malacca, uh, near uh, Malacca. Uh, Malacca, I, I've forgotten now what, probably Malacca Gateway or something project, where they say we'll build another Singapore and that be the end of Singapore. That uh, all the isthmus Kra Canal, you know, that's another, uh, you know. So there are all kinds of um, ideas, but the, all these ideas stem from a long-term plan that we want to be the, the uh, a long-term plan of primacy. And I can, and the thing about the Indian Ocean is that once the Chinese have established uh, their primacy along the first island chain, which again is not, is, is, is not, it's not as though it's a kind of an, uh, it will happen. Uh, they will move into the Indian Ocean. When they move into the Indian Ocean, uh, they already have substantive uh, presence. At, uh, at any given time, 15 to 20 ships, Chinese ships are there in the, in the Indian Ocean. They built their first uh, base in Djibouti. Uh, in Gwadar, they have a, uh, which you can say it's probably a de facto, if not a de jure base uh, in Gwadar. They're also looking for other places where they could uh, establish themselves. It's basically what I said to you earlier that they have, their economy has expanded hugely, but their military power has not caught up. And they are now trying to make the military power catch up. So in another decade or so, you will see maybe a permanent presence of an aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean region. Again, for us, fortunately, geography helps us, at least in the Indian Ocean, because we are a peninsula jutting out into the Indian Ocean. And as a peninsula jutting out into the Indian Ocean, we have certain uh, advantages of being where we are. Though, of course, this is, uh, must be, a caveat is there that we must get our act together. You know, We take three, four, five, six, seven years to build a ship. When the Chinese are churning them out on assembly line uh, scale, uh, we, got, we have to do better than we have been doing. We've got to up our game uh, substantially. Um, Dr. Raj Kedin. Well, up, 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 come forward. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Aparna. Um, Manoj, I'm sorry I missed your talk. Uh, but uh, just a comment and a question. Uh, the isthmus of Kra, the water levels are very different on both sides. So it's a huge engineering problem to, to build a canal across the isthmus of Kra. Uh, talking of uh, the Chinese incursions, do you see a grand strategy, or is it, are these random uh, occasions uh, that they are intruding on across the line of control here and there, uh, periodically in varying strengths and for various durations of time? Uh, so I wonder if, if there's a grand strategy behind that. And is, was there a, a failure of, again, of Indian intelligence to have picked up on the movement of 15,000 troops into the Dhokla region, and, and four bulldozers is what I understand. And there are 150 tanks also, somebody has mentioned. So just comments on those, thanks. See, there are about, uh, we have, as you know, that the border between India and China is marked out by a line of actual control, which is a virtual line, in the sense uh, we have what we, we say there's a line of actual control, which the Chinese know where it is, and the Chinese say the same. That, uh, there's a line of actual control where the Indians know where it is. But the, approximately, there are about 14 places where the notion overlaps. In the sense, we say the line is at that end. They say the line is at this end, you see? And so there's this area here, which we both patrol, is about 14 places, not very, uh, I think maybe 12, 13, 14 kilometers, some place, maybe in the uh, Depsang area, uh, a little bit more. Uh, so there's this overlap. So eventually when you, uh, but the thing is that as of now, there is agreement that we can patrol in this area, in this overlap area, but we can't put fixed structures and camps there. That's the broad agreement between us. So the 2013 crisis that took place in 2013 was because they came and pitched tents in the middle of that Depsang Plains. And when they pitched tents there, which was changing the uh, rules of the game, which then triggered off that particular crisis. Now, the thing is that when, when uh, whether uh, these are random or they are not, I'm, you see, that, that, that Depsang crisis took place 
about uh, 30 days before Li Keqiang was going to come to Delhi. He was scheduled to come to Delhi. And in fact, curiously enough, uh, all we had to do was to tell the Chinese that if you don't pull out from there, no visit for Li Keqiang. And that, of course, would have been a big loss of face because the Chinese vis premier's visit is called off. So the Chinese pulled up, pulled up their tents and went off. Now, the second instance happened when uh, Xi Jinping himself was in New Delhi. Xi Jinping himself was in uh, uh, New Delhi, and that this, this is uh, uh, a place called Chumur. Now, the strange thing is that in Chumur, uh, the Indians have the dominating positions. In one of the few areas, Indians have the dominating positions, yet the Chinese are trying to build a road. I think, you know, at some point, what happens is that what we often don't realize is Chinese foreign policy is not made by their foreign office. It's made by the PLA often, meaning particularly on the Sino-Indian border. If you look at the Border Defense Cooperation Agreement, it's signed by a PLA general. You know, so the, the, the policy is often made by the PLA. Now, many people said rogue generals and all that. That's all nonsense. The PLA is very, very, uh, the, uh, the, in fact, the officers who were involved there were subsequently promoted, uh, the Chinese officers. So I think there is, there are signals there, though they're very difficult to discern what exactly is China trying to do. Is it China trying to push and say, let's settle, or this going to continue? Or are they trying to keep the whole border permanently uh, unsettled? Now the, um, the, the interesting consequence, I told you about the herders uh, uh, issue, the depopulation issue. What we are now witnessing in the Sino-Indian border is that, first of all, the Chinese had built their infrastructure in the Tibetan side, very good infrastructure, roads, etc. Uh, we are playing catch up. We are still trying to build our roads because our side is much tougher. Our, our, our terrain is much worse than the Chinese side. But now we are detecting signs that the Chinese are also building further infrastructure to populate those areas. So they are building multi-storied buildings, etc., uh, where their military formations can live through the year. Otherwise, Chinese, to be uh, very frank, you know, don't go by these figures that say the Chinese have got 30 divisions in Tibet. They actually have three brigades, you know, which is uh, about, what, uh, 15,000 men. In, uh, as far as the PLA is concerned, PAP may be uh, greater there. They have a big surge capacity because they have the infrastructure. They, they, they have a surge capacity to build up forces there. But now it seems that they are also planning to in, increase the number of uh, forces that they put up on the uh, Sino-Indian border uh, because they, have, they are now confronting much stronger Indian forces. See, in the last decade, we have raised two new divisions entirely for the uh, Sino-Indian border. Now we are raising another core, that is three divisions plus for the Sino-Indian border. So the Indian... Uh, defenses have been strengthened to the point where now the Chinese are a bit worried that because for them Tibet is always a vulnerability. They're worried as to what uh, the Indians could do. That, as they say that you you look at the when you say when India says that we are developing a strike core, what is a strike core? A strike core is a core that will fight on your side of the border, meaning and the, uh, will go into Tibet. So when India has that capacity. Uh, the Chinese, obviously, which they did not have till now, it, it clearly worries the Chinese, and 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 so they are uh, also now reacting on that uh, on that front. Dr. Cronstadt, you get the last final question. Thank you, um, Alan Cronstadt, Congressional Research Service, and I wanted to follow up a little on uh, Aparna's question about your very interesting piece on the Quad. Um, so um, while the World War II example is an illustrative one, uh, it, it was an alliance of necessity. Uh, and, and it's worth remembering that, that the Soviets were uh, treaty allies of the Germans up until mid-1941. But um, if Chinese troops were on the march, um, I, I think there's no problem India, US, Australia, say, signing on with Vietnam to, to fight you know, a military battle. Um, but now it, the, the necessity isn't there, so uh, national governments have can be more circumspect, can take a little more time. I've always rejected the view, tended to reject the view that, that uh, there's fixed interests for countries, that they actually can grow out of values. 
having a conversation with Polly earlier, um, that values can determine interest to some extent. But let's set aside values and talk like in the in the um, the cooperation between the four navies after the tsunami, the 2004 tsunami that uh, afflicted uh, India, Sri Lanka, the Indian Ocean. Um, the governments found out that humanitarian assistance, uh, disaster relief efforts went quite well, uh, could have gone even better if there were better coordination and inter interoperability. So that was kind of the basis for that. And then a couple of years later, you did have four navies in 2007 um, conduct joint exercises, mainly on the HADR. Um, but India and Australia both expressed wariness and nervousness about uh, the reactions from China, uh, and India did not want to have anything more than trilateral um, after that. Uh, so you started including, say, ASW, uh, anti-submarine exercises in the Indian Ocean. Clearly, uh, we could argue, one could argue, that it's in the interests of all four countries to have better interoperability when it comes to things like anti-submarine warfare. So in the 10 years since that first uh, quad exercise, we've seen, as you mentioned, some Djibouti military base for China, China sending nuclear submarines into the Indian Ocean, uh, Gwadar, Hambantota, et cetera. Um, set aside the values question, uh, isn't it in the interests of India to have, um, to increase its interoperability in the, in the naval scene, maritime security, with what are called like-minded countries. Uh, and these countries are like-minded based on perceived interests rather than anything to do with values. So how would you argue against um, uh, a preference for quadrilateral naval exercises, uh, given this argument? I think, you know, uh, a, lot of it, uh, a lot of it rests on our history, in the sense of the last 50, 60 years the experience that we had, the kind of perspective we had, you know, this, uh, we went out through the Cold War as a kind of uh, self-consciously self non-aligned, etc. So we are coming from there. And the United States and its current partners are coming from another place. Okay, they went through the Korean War, they went through the Vietnam War, uh, Seattle, the dissolution of Seattle, uh, you know, uh, coming from there. The question is, as you rightly pointed, you know that we have seen that there are uh, there are congruences. HADR was definitely uh, one of them. Uh, the difficulties, you know, often arise in a different way, in the sense that you know when you use the word interoperability, that causes us a huge amount of nervousness. You know, it it uh, so in fact in that recent uh, that that. Uh, the the uh, that agreement on communication security. No, no, the Comca Com Comcasa. So Comcasa has a changed version of what used to be the interoperability thing. So they, because the Indians were nervous about, so they have changed the terminology. I have forgotten exactly I, uh, the the whole uh, agreement. Uh, so let me put the thing the other way around. In the sense, yes. Because of Indian failure to maintain, uh, to to keep it, to get into the high growth path economically, and to reform its military, and to modernize its military, you know, it is now in a situation where it needs external friends, okay, to balance uh, China. It's a necessity. Likewise, for the United States. There is a certain necessity in balancing China because no other, uh, no other country can fit the bill. Only a country of India's size and height uh, can provide a counterbalance. When you look at and and the problem is that the United States has uh, so far historically dealt with allies for whom it's the net security provider, whether it is Japan, whether it is Australia, whether it is United Kingdom. All these countries depend on the United States for its security, for their security. India is one country which doesn't, it's not dependent and doesn't want to be dependent on the United States for its security. So what is India seeking? India is seeking more of a partnership. Now the question is of fixing the model. Because you see, it's one thing to have, uh, to be a junior partner, a junior ally, which Japan and Australia are, to be very frank. 
they are junior allies they are not uh, you know uh, and india doesn't want to be in that uh, position politically but as i said i also acknowledge the fact that india needs something from the united states and of course then uh, beyond that is the question of trying to shape common interests and i think we have a common interest and this is why i gave the example of the persian gulf and uh, northern arabian sea area we have a common interest in 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 stability in the area just 2 years ago we had to rescue uh, citizens from yemen even today if you look at the situation there are parts of it could blow up any time and we have citizens all over the place there yet we have zero conversation so we can't have a uh, a kind of a schizophrenic relationship you know if if there are issues if there are naval issues we can't say no 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 we, we, let's not go into that area we keep your keep an eye only on this area so i think that the, the we need this continuous um, uh, conversation in 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 this and that's why i said that if you're doing hdr you can't restrict hdr just to the pacom area but surely it could also take place in the centcom area so this division of centcom pacom uh, is something which uh, which uh, i think is very negative because if we are going to have if we are talking of this of this uh, new uh, new relationship between india and the united states these are things issues which we, we must address uh with some uh, you know sort of uh, with some degree of attention because we are talking of the new south asia policy which we are talking of the united states becoming uh, more skeptical of pakistan uh, because why the centcom why was india excluded from the centcom it has to do with pakistan you know the united states didn't want the two in the same uh, uh, setup so it's a work in progress but as i said there are also fundamental issues and as i said one of those issues was the nature of the relationship so the 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 interoperability etc uh, there's no doubt that they are they are very useful like interoperability in communications like we have bought the united states um, p8i uh, aircraft but we are not able to uh, get the best out of them in terms of uh, dealing with the us now it is a, for example we get information from the us on chinese submarine movements okay we are getting information from the us on chinese submarine movements but that information cannot have that same kind of uh, vibrancy because there is not direct information it has to be filtered through the various commands because we because we are because our pitis are not going to being able to speak to the pitas of the uh, that the us operates so we've taken a step in a direction but we have to work out the terms of engagement and the, uh, what india is saying is that we uh, the our terms of engagement cannot be the same as the terms of engagement you had with countries for whom you are the net security provider our terms of engagement have to be different and i think the us also should not object because in the sense we are not asking the us to come and Uh, you know uh, boots on the ground or that kind of a uh, scenario whereas the japanese and the koreans you know for them it's absolutely sine qua non of the whole situation that unless the americans promise boots on the ground there's no no value in the relationship um on that note uh, we will end the discussion thank you dr joshi thank you to everybody who came today and who's watching online thank you